You've heard stories of the Sierra Madre Casino. We all have. This story's different than the others. It's all in promise of beginnings. And the ending. Dog forgot himself, as did the voice that raged within him. After their passing, a new voice spoke within the mutant shell. It was difficult for the voice to remember the two it once was. There was the beast, Dog consumed by hunger, and the other in reverse, the one consumed by control. Both were driven by need for the other. The courier brought them together somehow, joined the two into one. All that happened at the Sierra Madre was a faint memory to the new personality. Like a flickering light in the clouds of the mind, the new voice did not think of the courier again, until the battle of the Divide reached his ears. The battle between the two couriers, beneath the torn skies and the old world flag, each bearing a message for the other. And the mutant prayed the courier that had saved him had been saved in return. Dean Domino, entertainer, singer, thief at his last show on the Sierra Madre stage. The heist he spent over 200 years planning fell apart, just as the first, by underestimating his partner's strength. Not long after the courier left the villa, the lights in the theater shut off one by one. Only Dean's hologram remained on the stage, singing silently to an empty room. Still, as consumed as he had been with its riches and ruin, the Sierra Madre had held him captive long ago. Christine, her mission complete. Found new purpose as the Sierra Madre's warden. She watched over it silently. By choice. Over time, the ghost people came to see her as one of the holograms. They would watch silently as she walked among them. At times, Christine thought of the courier, who had kept Elijah's hand from her throat. The courier reminded her of the other courier she had met in the Big Empty, and wondered if the two had found each other at last. She did not think of them again until she heard the legends of the Divide. The Divide, where the two messengers, the two couriers, fought beneath an ancient flag, at the edge of the world. You heard of the Sierra Madre Casino. We all have. The legend. The curses. Some foolishness about it lying in the middle of a city of dead. A city of ghosts. Buried beneath a blood-red cloud. A bright, shining monument luring treasure hunters to their doom. An illusion that you can begin again, change your fortunes. Finding it, though, that's not the hard part. It's letting go. Vide erupted in fire as the flame trail of the two couriers' last message arced into the sky. Missiles fell on the east and the Legion encampment at Drywells, where the Twisted Hears had allied, then been betrayed by Wolpus and Kaisar. Legion soldiers died, their silhouettes blasted into the ground and earth, the last word of the last of the Twisted Hears. It was an ending to things. A way of erasing the road that had led to this point and the history that had walked with it.
Hopeville burned lightless in the night, invisible fires of radiation scorching it from within and without. It is said a man still walked its streets with a tattered jacket and old world flag etched on the back. He remained there, perhaps as punishment for the scars he left on the wastes, or a reminder of a history he could not forget. For Ulysses, his journey was over. The courier had been the end of his road. As for the courier, he turned his back on his home for the second time and made his way back, navigating the treachery of the Divide. Tunnelers and the marked men avoided the lone figure, as if recognizing the courier's right to passage, or out of fear. The courier walked until he stood again upon the edge of the Divide, the last road he would walk before the second battle for Hoover Dam. There, beside his feet, was a final package from one courier to another. A footlocker bearing a gift and a message. But that message, it is something for couriers to carry and for them alone. The lights flickered across the divide. Reminders that the old world histories persist and find meaning in the present. It said, war, war never changes. Men do, through the roads they walk. And this road has reached its end. And so it was that the conflict between the new Canaanites and the White Legs was finally resolved. The courier's involvement had tipped the scale, shifting the fragile balance of power. Joshua Graham's chilling execution of salt upon wounds seared into their minds. The surviving White Legs retreated to the Great Salt Lake. Unable to shake the memory of their brutal defeat and the dead horse's savagery in battle, the White Legs feared further reprisals. They fled north, out of Utah, into Wyoming. The wilderness was harsh, and the first winter claimed over half the tribe. When spring came, the survivors parted ways in small bands, and so the White Legs died a quiet, ignominious death. The sorrows fought beside Joshua Graham and the dead horses, eradicating the threat the White Legs posed to Zion. Watching as the courier encouraged Joshua Graham to execute salt upon wounds, the Sorrows learned that New Canaan offered no mercy to the wicked. The Sorrows' transformation from a peaceful, like people, broke Daniel's heart. Over time, the Sorrows became ever more ruthless in their dealings, even with each other. Daniel traveled to and fro between the New Canaanites and Zion, continuing to plead for a return to the old ways whenever he visited. Eventually, the Sorrows grew tired of his blather and turned their backs on him. Having helped eradicate the White Legs from Zion, the Dead Horses returned to Dead Horse Point in triumph. They remained neutral toward the Sorrows, but as years went on, there were periods of competitive friction, even violence between the tribes. The new Canaanites, Daniel especially, intervened regularly as mediators but found it difficult to reconcile the tribe's conflicts. The defeat of the White Legs and Zion marked a turning point in the fortunes of the Happy Trails Caravan Company. Every two months, the caravan met with the new Canaanites in Zion Valley to trade. Happy Trails soon returned to prosperity. The vigilance of the sorrows and dead horses in defending southwestern Utah, initially startling to Happy Trails caravans, soon proved a blessing. The tribes united against the Aids, driving them back from Highway 50 
and thus opening yet another trading route for Happy Trails Caravans. Waking Cloud turned bitter and resentful toward Daniel and the new Canaanites when she learned her husband's death had been concealed from her. She poisoned some of her tribe against new Canaanite teachings, making relations between the groups difficult from time to time. With the white legs crushed, Joshua Graham led the sorrows and dead horses in tearing apart and burning the corpses of their enemies. He set about training his army in the way of the Canaanite, and soon the new Canaanites and tribes of Zion were feared well into the Mojave. Legends of the Burned Man grew even more depraved and terrifying. For years after the defeat of the White Legs, Daniel did his best to minister to the Sorrow's spiritual needs. Try as he might, he could not hold back the tribe's increasing militancy and reverence of Joshua Graham. Demoralized, he returned to his family and dead horse point. His failures haunted him for the rest of his days. And with that, the courier walked out of the history of the tribes of Zion and back to the gathering storm of the Mojave Wasteland. It'd been in the years before the Great War, Big Mountain, the Big Empty, became home to one of the brightest minds of the 23rd century. The courier watched over the Big Empty for years to come, caring for it and keeping its discovery safe until they were needed to help others, which had always been Big Mountain's purpose. Past the laboratories and science, it had always been intended as a place to build the future of all mankind. The SYNC Central Intelligence Unit was impressed by the amount of exploration the courier had undertaken. Facilities believed lost, destroyed, or ones that had simply gotten up and walked to new locations had been rediscovered by its intrepid new master. Internally, the artificial personality debated as to whether it preferred the old management to the new and concluded that the courier's thorough approach to research and investigation was admirable and worthy of its respect. The Forbidden Zone continued to be, true to its name, forbidden. No more Robo-Scorpions were sighted in its canyons. Big Mountain became even emptier, devoid of Dr. Mobius's proclamations forecasting the destruction of anything that dared possess sentience. Still, it is said he lived on in the equations inscribed on the floor and walls of the Forbidden Zone Dome, a cobweb tracery of symbols that told of a thousand brilliant thoughts, now lost to time. The sink atop the dome bustled with the voices of a small town, constantly chirping, arguing, and snarling at each other. Still, this all happened productively in the interests of its new owner. The sink Central Intelligence Unit discovered, despite its inversion code, it was comforted by the sense of community the other personalities gave it. The biological research station, obsessed with seeding everything in sight, requested a transfer to the X-22 Botanical Garden so that it might, in its own words, sensually fertilize the garden's smooth contours. The garden sent back a polite refusal, saying it had prior commitments with a vault it had helped infect before the war. The book shoot continued to devour all seditious materials until it nearly choked on a paperclip. It adamantly maintained it was a Chinese paperclip and the whole thing had been an elaborately orchestrated assassination attempt. Whatever the reason, it slowed down for a while, carefully appraising each document and clipboard that came to it. The light switches continued to bicker and flicker. This persisted until the day someone dropped a flashlight in the sink, and the two of them united in their hatred of the showboat. One of them eventually transferred to the Lightwave Dynamics plant and began a long, unrequited affair with one of the holograms. The soon continued to ruthlessly scrub any particulate matter that came near it. Eventually, it gained access to the Magneto Hydraulics plant and nearly flooded all the big empty in an attempt to scrub the crater clean. Once it learned of the innovative toxins plant, however, 
it gained new purpose. It sought to develop antitoxins to flush into its drains and counteract the poisons bleeding into the soil. The toaster continued its psychotic spree, reducing all appliances in range to scrap electronics and spare parts. After one of its more psychotic episodes, however, the other sink personalities decided enough was enough and dumped the toaster in a bathtub. Sparking and hissing, the toaster swore its enemies would rue the day when they had bread and no way to toast it. Muggy did his best to collect coffee cups, although in his quest, he accidentally trapped himself in Higgs Village. It might have been the end for poor Muggy, except he found it peaceful there, tidying up the kitchens of the think tank professors back when they had been flesh and bone. Well, except for Dr. O, who was an asshole for having created Muggy in the first place. Muggy left O's house deliberately dirty, punishing the dishes and cups that lived there in blind revenge for serving Dr. O. Blind Owl Jefferson, with sounds the courier brought him, created a symphonic counter-frequency that saved Big Mountain from sonic invasion in 2910. If you didn't hear about it, good. It was rumored by the other personalities that he had a brief fling with the light switches. Although, he forgot their names once too often and was soon left in the dark as punishment. Autodoc, always gentle and methodical, kept sewing up the courier in all the right places when the skin split open from repeated wear and tear. The Autodoc was just glad to have purpose again. It heard its simpler brothers and sisters who got shipped to the Sierra Madre were bored out of their skulls in that toxic dead city. In time, the Autodoc found a way to deactivate the Y-17 trauma harnesses, releasing the corpses they had held prisoner for almost 200 years. As the courier ran through the X-8 facility multiple times, the computers analyzed the test subject's movements. Rather than performing a superficial observation, they realized the subject barely knew what communism was, or even what a high school was. This confused them for a time, until the facility finally realized that its research had succeeded. So it let its cyber dogs out into the wastes to help protect small communities from physical aggression rather than communist propaganda. The infiltration program in X-13 felt spent, having repeatedly upgraded the stealth suit until it could upgrade it no more. It felt warm, fulfilled, and a bit sluggish. It realized not long after, the stealth suit had left it, without so much as a note on the nightstand. So the infiltration program sent out robo-brains into the wastes, looking for its wayward technology. It eventually found Repcon HQ, and set up a new research center, testing and murdering fiends who kept breaking into the facility. The courier, organs intact, continued onwards, a little less heavy of step, but with all the organs in the right places, as they should be. After all, brains can develop a life of their own when left to their own thoughts, and the courier's brain was more clever than most. Dr. Klein and the think tank remained alive, unaware of the world outside. They looped through their daily routine, none the wiser about the world beyond. Although perhaps wiser was the wrong word, the world outside belonged to the courier. And if anyone would shape it, well, the courier had already called dibs. There is an expression in the wasteland, old world blues. It refers to those so obsessed with the past, they can't see the present, much less the future, for what it is. They stare into the what was. Eyes like pilot lights, guttering and spent, as the realities of their world continue on around them. Science is a long, steady progression into the future. 
what may seem a sudden event often isn't felt for years, even centuries to come. In the times following the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, however, Old World Blues took on a new meaning. Where once it was viewed as a form of sadness, nostalgia, it became an expression describing the potential for the future. It can be easy to see science as evil, technology unchecked as the source of all ills, all misfortunes. With the courier at the helm, science became a beacon for the future. There was old world blues, and new world hope, and hope ruled the day at Big Mountain. We could say more. But the stories in the big empty speak for themselves. Now armed with the transportal ponder, the courier could return to the dome at any time and crack open the secrets of the big empty one by one. The sink sat vigilant, waiting for its master to return, shoes covered in Mojave dust. Only one road yet remained, and it was one the courier had to walk alone. <laughs>